on and work it, lady. Yeah, that's how you work it, lady. It's never nor maybe this is how you hey. do it, baby. Work, work. How's it going? All right, we are going to get into it in just a moment. Thanks so much for listening, and I can't wait to chat on this one with you guys. Put your body in the- Generational trauma stops with your mama. And work it, lady. Yeah, that's how you work it, lady. Hey. It's never nor maybe. This is how you get it, baby. Work, work. All right, ladies. I am so happy to be chatting with you guys today. Um, I hope you are enjoying your summer. Um, I hope you are out there having fun in the sun. It's great to kind of go on vacation and unwind. So I hope you're doing that and I hope you're having a good time. I did want to come on today um, because with everything that is going on in Hollyweird, (laughs) and if you're watching on YouTube, you see I have my little Hollywood, Hollyweird sign up here, and I'm going to be sharing some visuals, um, some of which are my actual pictures of my time in Hollywood, um, working behind the scenes and all that jazz, and just some other stuff um, regarding the topic in general. But we are going to be talking about a lot of things today um, because of this whole um, writer strike um, and everything that's going on there. And you have the whole AI and all of that. We're going to talk about all of that today. We're going to talk about um, you know behind the scenes at Hollywood. We are going to talk about my personal experience that I want to share with you guys um, from working in the Hollywood industry, in Hollywood, and AI, um, and how that is changing Hollywood, especially, but also the music industry, and how it does affect us as well. So I'm going to go into a lot of stuff here, and uh, I'm not holding anything back, and, you know, if I offend anyone, you know, I am sorry in advance, but you know me, my goal here is always um, to be a source of help and encouragement, especially if this is something that is on your mind, or maybe you have an interest in this stuff or know someone who's trying to get into this, they may not want to after this video, or they will at least proceed with extreme <laughs> caution and, and some boundaries. So anyway, Hollywood, highly weird. Um, it's weird out there, guys. Hollywood is a weird, very, very, very weird. All right. So we're going to um, break it down in a couple of different ways. Um, there's so much to say on this, and I don't want to um, miss anything. But first, I want to start with this. Um, women have been coming out and speaking out um, against Hollywood and kind of the um, pay um, disparities that are there um, and 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 the, the treatment on set and just the treatment in Hollywood as a woman in general. And the image I have up right now is of some ladies, um, most of note, Shonda Rhimes, Eva Longoria, um, Reese Witherspoon, and some others um, that really all the way back in 2018, I believe it was, um, unveiled this anti-harassment action plan. And um, I have not, you know, read the plan or, you know, everything that they did, but what they did was set out to really just kind of say, hey, here are how on this is how unfair women are treated in Hollywood. Here is, you know, what the um, pay differences are for writers, for actresses, and all of that. And I thought from some of the things that I read, one of which was a piece that the New York Times did, you can certainly Google it and pull it up if you want. Um, They really did take some strides and do some good things. So it's nice to have women um, in Hollywood that are trying to, you know, make it a better place. And I think certainly if we have more Shonda rhymes and things like that, because I hear Shonda really takes care of her staff. Um, you know, she's a very well-respected writer now um, and everything. So it she's like top level creme de la creme 
So um, more of that in Hollywood would be helpful. So anyway, um, that is a side note there, but I did want to talk about that a little bit because, you know, it's important, you know, to not only highlight the issues, but people who are trying to actually help and address the issues and who are actually having success in that. OK, um, so now let's move it along just a little bit here. And um, let's really talk some more about Hollywood. So people Hollywood has kind of built this idea that, you know, it's just a place to be, you know, the streets are just, you know, paved with opportunity and lined with gold. And, you know, you're just going to have the the biggest, best experiences in Hollywood. And my experiences was, you know, nothing like that. I mean, there were some good times and I want to talk about all of that, but it's, you really can't go out there like that. Hollywood is a vacation spot, guys. It's a place to go if, um, you know, you're on vacation, you want to see some of the sites, which is basically just that, you know, Hollywood Boulevard, the, the Walk of Fame, go to the Grove and Celebrity Watch um, and go home, like literally, um, and try not to get mugged or step in feces, you know, on the street, human feces, that is, um, from the over, uh, you know, the, the issues with homelessness. Uh, and cramping on the sidewalks and everything. So um, anyway, number one thing you need to know, um, let's say you, you're you just, you know, looking at Hollywood through rose colored glasses, or you um, are someone who wants to work in the industry. Um, like I, I still do, but not in the ways that I used to just very low key now. Um, or, you know, you want to get into acting or whatever, or maybe you have a child because we're all mothers here, right? And they're seeing these TikTokers and YouTubers um, and everything. And they're they're having these TikToks. And then all of a sudden you see them in movies and, you know, they're on Netflix and all that. Half of those TikTokers, guys, are Nepo babies. So that means their parents are actually already celebrities. They paid, bought and paid for a following on TikTok because um, you can't do that through TikTok ads, Instagram ads and things like that. They build followings on these platforms with their mama and daddy's millions that they've already made in Hollywood and their grandparents have made. It's a whole generational nepotism. <laughs> OK, that's going on. And then they, um, you know, it looks like they just blow up. And so then our young ones could get confused and just be like, okay, so why am I not having this success? Well, they have a lot more behind them than we do. You know, we're we're coming from brick and mortar, building from the ground up, and they've got mommy and daddy funding them, and they got an aunt and uncle in the industry, and they got an agent and all this stuff, and they got people editing their TikTok videos. So it's not what you think. Um, there are some people on TikTok who are grassroots and become very successful, but most of the people actually are somehow already connected into Hollywood, into these industries when they just boom, blow up like that. So I want to just put that out there. So let's talk about, again, some of the nepotism in Hollywood. Um, if you're watching on YouTube up on the screen. Green, I have a great example of nepotism, and that's like Goldie Hawn and her daughter Kate Hudson. I don't have anything against anybody in Hollywood, or you know, nepotism is going to happen in any industry, right? If you own a grocery store or a restaurant and you have a child, you are going to encourage your child and give that child the monetary uh, and the educational things that they need to run that business. You're carrying on your legacy. You're doing your thing. There's nothing wrong with that. So a part of me doesn't, you know, can't really argue with the fact that, hey, okay, their mom was a successful actress. Their mom hooked them up with their agent and now they are. I mean, it stinks, but what can we do? I mean, you can't tell people not to help their kids be actors and actresses, right? So I see a lot of, you know, other YouTubers and podcasters, you know, just kind of slamming this whole idea. We all do it, guys. Even if you just work at a regular company, you know, you have a corporate job, you might be able to hire family members. Not all corporations allow that. But the ones that do, people hire their kids. They hire they, their cousins, their aunties. So nepotism is everywhere. So I do feel like we have to be fair um, about it. But I think that with nepotism, we do have to understand, like with Hollywood, if this is something that you're trying to do, which again, I don't encourage. 
um, because overall it's going to be a huge waste of time. And guys, only the top really 2% of people are making money in Hollywood. I mean, most people are getting two jobs a year, you know, for $2,000 and they're starving the rest of the time, you know, um, working a regular job, just like the rest of us. And it's a side hustle for them. So, you know, it's, it's, you just can't come into it with that mindset. Um, and it's just not worth it. It's much more worth it to have a simple life. Um, a lot of these people have money and fame, but they don't have privacy. And when you give up your privacy, you put yourself into the category of becoming mentally compromised, becoming mentally ill, because privacy is very important um, to us emotionally. So when you give that up for money, you are going to have mental issues. And, you know, a lot of the top people in Hollywood, or even you look at some of the child stars, child actresses and things, they have mental issues. So this is not something that you really want to get into. Okay. Um, now, in regards to the nepotism, there's another type of, you could almost call it nepotism that is in Hollywood. And that is, um, organizational connections, like religious connections. So um, example, a lot of Hollywood is actually Jewish. So a lot of the um, movie producers, you think Spielberg, okay, even Adam Sandler, all of these people are Jewish. The top people in Hollywood making movies are Jewish. And <laughs> Being in Hollywood and kind of just seeing behind the scenes, like talking to some of the different actors on set when I was doing their hair and makeup or whatever, it's like, oh, well, I I converted to Judaism so I could get cast and I could be, you know, there's this producer that I really liked and does a lot of movies. He's Jewish, so I joined his synagogue so I could get booked. People do that. People are legit out there changing religions to get booked. And it works. And a lot of them do. Um, and so that is something absolutely, you know, you, you're not going to want to compromise that. You're not going to want to, you know, get into something just for the sake of, you know, advancing your career, um, you know, and, and everything. So that's a whole nother topic that can get very deep. But I just wanted to share that little blur because I don't think people are aware um, that that is factored into who is successful in Hollywood and who isn't, okay? Um, now, another one, though, that I want to talk about um, with the organizations um, and, and the religion is Scientology, okay? So um, that is another one um, that is big out there, and I'll share this with you. Now I'm starting to get my other one. Um, up on the screen, bear with me. I kind of have been putting some some pictures together here. And this one, if it will come up, come on, come on, come on, come on. Why is this taking so long? That's bizarre. Mostly guys, bear with me. What's happening? Okay. So here. Did I pause it? Yes, I did. So here, um, if you are on YouTube right now, you see this central casting kind of here um, in the middle. Um, this is the outside of central casting. This is one of the main place where you are going to go if you are a background actor, okay? You're going to go to central casting. You're going to get signed up, and that is where you can become um, a background actor, um, and appearance scenes. Uh oh, this is going. This is going too fast. Hold on, I gotta back it up here. Back it up. Um, so that is where you are going to go if you are trying to get into that. Um, this is also kind of a stepping stone to get into SAG AFTRA, um, the labor union that is currently striking. Um, you can earn a lot of your credits and things by you know signing up at Central Castings and you know going to all the auditions, some of the things you get just, you know, get approved for and your cast. You just go on as background. Um, when I signed up for this, okay, there were people from Scientology literally coming up to everyone in line and saying, hey, if you join Scientology, we'll get you to the top of the list for castings. We will actually submit you to castings. You don't even have to do it. We'll submit you to 100 castings a day and we'll make sure that you get them. 
Just come to our meetings, come and support, and then we're going to do all of this for you. It was very bizarre um, and a little scary. And matter of fact, one day um, I was in line and people line up here like they line up at the DMV. Like you need to get there early and camp out because the line is literally down the street a lot of the times. And um, yeah, they would just come in line and kind of just harass people. Um, most people, you know, would say not interested, but a lot of people were interested. But I did have an interesting conversation one day um, with uh, someone I ended up being on set with a couple of times who said, um, you know, they were just harassing him all of the time. You know, he like took one of their things and said, oh, maybe I'll check it out. And it's like constant phone calls he got, you know, they would just show up at his job, like all kinds of crazy things. He was really funny about it. He was kind of like a comedic character. He's like, they were trying to hypnotize me. They crazy. Like he was just going off. But, um, you know, he shared a lot of important information. You know, I would just turn my back whenever they come around and just not, you know, really engage. But to have that, you know, his his viewpoint of what happened um, was very interesting. So I'm going to talk now a little bit. Oh, wait, I actually there's one other point that I want to talk about. So we talked about two things already. We talked about nepotism in Hollywood is one reason you likely are going to have some push back and not get to the level you you really want to. Then you have these religious connections with um, being Jewish or being in Scientology. This is another thing that gets folks to the front of the line. Um, and then the next one is sex, drugs, and partying. Um, and if you are a party person and like to go out and do the drinking and the this and the drugs, like all the crazies, a lot of those people who engage in that activity, they have sex with a lot of the producers and things like that, end up getting to the front of the line. And that's something that I found so interesting with that whole Me Too movement is, you know, and I'm not ever slamming any woman for coming out and sharing her story. However, this was all after the fact that these women, most of them participated in the act of having sex with these individuals to get ahead. So they did it. So why would you do that? You know what I'm saying? Why would you compromise your body, your health, you know, your physical health and your mental health and your morals and who you are as a person to go stand up on somebody's Dusty Hollywood set just to say you were on TV or to get a million dollars or to get the role that you always wanted of your dreams? Why would you do that? So you have to look at this Hollywood stuff, guys as really the sham and joke that it is. It's a joke. They are selling you a pipe dream that is not a reality for 99% of people. The people who do okay are the people who say, this is a side hustle thing for me. I just need some extra money. Whenever I get called, I'll go, but I got a real job and I do that. Or the people who are nepotism babies, unfortunately, and just have the, the the connection in, and then maybe they don't have to go through some of the, the trauma that comes with Hollywood. They could just, you know, ride their parents' coattails or whatever. Um, but it, this is real stuff, guys. So those are three major roadblocks to getting into the successful arena in Hollywood that most people are going to have to go through. And you're going to go through those things with some battle scars, okay? You are going to go through with some battle scars. And so you have to ask yourself, is it really worth it? Now, I'm going to talk about my little, you know, mini stuff that I did in Hollywood. So how did I even get into this mess? First of all, I never wanted to actually be in any of this mess. Okay, it is not my goal. I do not think fame is a good thing. Um, I do not think it is good to put yourself out there in a lot of the way that these people do. And I do have some very strong morals um, that do not align with 90% of what goes on, you know, in Hollywood. So what happened was I started out um, doing hair and makeup. I, I would do anything, you know, weddings, you know, I used to teach. And eventually I started getting calls before, you know, I ever moved to LA to do onset work. 
And I did that in another region on the other side of the country. And it was very nice. It was very professional. It It's not Hollywood at all. You know, you're not having weird experiences. Everybody's professional. It's like a nine to five job. Okay, you show up. We're going to shoot this video that is talking about um, women's health or it's talking about, you know, um, just something very general, um, nothing, you know, political or, you know, anything in any direction. So it was very much a good fit for me doing that type of work in that market because I was not dealing with all of this weird stuff. There was no sex and drugs on set. There was no, you didn't need to go through a religion or anything like that to do what I was doing. The phone simply rang and I said, oh, I would, you know, that sounds fun doing hair and makeup for sets. I'd like to do that. That's something that, you know, doesn't seem to be an issue. So then of course we moved to a different region. I had kind of done everything I could do in that region anyway. And of course anyone wants to kind of, you know, test out their career a little bit, you know, well, how could I, you know, get a little more, um, you know, higher pay grade or whatever, or, you know, just wanting to try something different. So we ended up moving to a different region, which happened to be Los Angeles. And I said, oh, okay, well, I'm kind of in one of the major regions now, maybe I'll give a shot going more so into this. So I stopped doing my wedding and salon work. And I did teach um, as well um, in Los Angeles. Um, but I said, you know what, on the side, I will do hair and makeup on set. Working in the hair and makeup department is very different than being in front of the camera. But even that, you're still exposed to a lot. So, you know, even though that's where I spent majority of my time was doing hair and makeup behind the scenes and being a behind the scenes worker in Hollywood, you're still exposed to stuff. You see it here a lot, and it's just not the best environment. Although there were some sets that were totally fine, that were, you know, very professional. Everybody showed up, did their job, and there wasn't any issues. Um, so it can really go either way. Um, so yeah, so then what happened, you know, every now and then this started before I even I moved to Los Angeles. Every now and then you have a actress or a model who does not show up to set. And so the producer is scrambling, who can I put in this spot? I've hired a hair person. I've hired, you know, a camera guy. I've hired, hired lighting, blah, blah, blah. Who can I put in? So I'm standing there. I'm the makeup artist. Hey, do you think you could do it? You going to cut me another check? Sure. Okay, I'll do it. So that's kind of how I got into doing just like little modeling actressy things um for myself. So I have worked behind the scenes in Hollywood and I worked um in front of the camera as well. Um and that was basically it. So you know one thing leads to another, you know, you, you you all a lot of the stuff you need an agent for and you know thankfully some of those things did work out as well. But that was always a very part-time, hey, that's just a side hustle for me. Um, and I was very selective about um, the way I present, the things I will wear, the things I will not wear. Um, all was listed in my bio and made clear um, to the agents, you know, and whoever was casting. And so I didn't get a lot because of that, which was fine with me because it's not really what I wanted to do anyway. Um, but I did get a good amount of hair and makeup work, working behind the scenes, um, and that I really, um, I, I really felt like I really did, um, overall enjoy. However, working on set in Hollywood behind the scenes is very different than working anywhere else. I remember it was my first shoot. Yeah, it was my first shoot in Hollywood. And all of a sudden, I'm working, I'm doing hair and makeup, and I see this like little fire light on the side. I look over, somebody's smoking crack on set. And I'm like, am I seeing this? I've never seen drugs in my entire life, guys. Like I am just like from the suburbs and never exposed to any type of criminal activity like that. So it was literally scary. I threw some makeup on them girls' face so bad and got out of there. I was like, ooh, I don't feel well. I feel like I'm going to pass out. I think I got to go home. I'm going to throw up. Some, something didn't agree with me for lunch. 
I don't know what I said. I made something up though and got out of there. Cause it, it's a situation like that. You don't want to call people out on what they were doing because it was the set quickly changed from professional to this is very scary. And I may not get out of here safely if I am too vocal about anything. So I literally had to just say so. And I wasn't feeling good. So it wasn't a straight up lie. I sure enough was not feeling good up in there when I saw that stuff. And um, I had never experienced anything like that. So that the first day, like going out on set like that and having that experience, I was like, whoa, this is way different. I had worked on set for years prior to stepping on set in LA and never had an experience like that. So it was very different to see um, that. And it immediately put me in a space of, okay, it's time to reevaluate. This is really not the place for me. Um, I don't want to be exposed to drugs. I don't want to be around this type of atmosphere. I ain't going to jail for nobody because if, if a cop were to walk in and there was someone had drugs out, the whole lot's going in. Okay. So that was another reason I was like, I need to get out of this situation literally as fast as possible. So, um, yeah, so that was, you know, I had multiple experiences like that. Another one was, was also very bizarre. That one's so bizarre. I don't think I'm actually going to share it. Unfortunately, you could DM me about it. Um, but it was just something, you know, kind of in the lines of a cult. And I, I noticed that a lot. I had a lot of experiences like that on set out there that were either drugs or something would happen with a cult type stuff and all that. And I know I'm not into any of that. Um, you know, again, I am, you know, kind of a, a straight laced. Those in my 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 close group on my Instagram, we are in likeness of mind and we are alike in our faith. And, you know, we are not about any of that. And so those were major red flags to me. And I continue to reevaluate. And um, I got very specific. I got in with a group um, that was literally, you know, it was a women-owned company and just very, you know, we just go in, we do our hair and makeup and we leave. Um, and I had an agency that was doing um, just like commercial print work um, primarily and a little bit of commercial work, but it's very much like, hey, show up and talk about car insurance. Hey, show up and do six jumping jacks for this, you know, uh, running pants that we're trying to sell. So I got very good at, hey, this is my lane and I ain't going nowhere else. Okay. Literally nowhere else because it was frightening. Okay. Oh, I had to take a drink there. So again, this is kind of my experience. Um, you know, um, working in Hollywood, you know, in front of the camera as a model actress and behind the camera as a hair and makeup artist. So if you're watching on YouTube, um, I do have some pictures of, you know, kind of the, the some of the fun things that happened, a couple of the celebs that, you know, there was a lot. And I, I'm not a picture taker. Um, some of these pictures that are up with the celebs, the act, celebs actually asked us to be in the picture. The only one um, other one was the one with comment. I was like, hey, I'll get a picture with, Con you know, he just seemed very nice, you know, Um but this one with Tori, Tori Spelling was very nice too. And that was just, you know, at work. The, the Grove in LA is the place where if you are just wanting to hang out and do the cutesy thing. And okay, let me start over again. There aren't very many nice shopping centers in LA. <laughs> the Grove is literally like one of the only ones. Um, there are some other ones that are farther out. Um, you know, Playa del Rey has a nice little shopping area, but the suburban areas and other parts of the country, Arizona, um, Washington, DC, Northern Virginia, New Jersey, New York, they have more. LA literally has like a couple nice shopping centers and that's it. They got the Century City Mall, which is like an outdoor mall. That's a couple levels and the Grove. Those are the hangout, come look at me spots. That's it. And so that's another thing. If you're from an area that is 
affluent and is like a suburb even like north carolina is a beautiful example north carolina like the charlotte area you got gorgeous shopping center after gorgeous shopping center and all the shopping centers look good but not you know like, like it, there's literally just the grove and citrus city um there's other couple cute little spots you know um you know, one other nice little spot up in Burbank, a couple here, there, and the other place. But it's not like the whole place is looking like that. It's just not. So, but anyway, the Grove is a place where a lot of the celebrities go to do their shopping. And again, it's not big. It's literally got a Nordstrom. That's like the only main store. And a couple other little stores. That's it. Now, what they do do is they have this pop-up, which I got to work at. It's like where Kim Kardashian always launches her stuff. Um, and, you know, and this other company I was working for at the time um, was launching their skincare and I was managing um, the pop-up. And Tori Spelling just happened to come in and say, hey, you know, I want to try this stuff. Tell me about it. And then she asked to take a photo with us. She was very sweet. So not all the celebrities are mean. There are some crazies. Um, I had a not very nice experience experience with Sheila LaBeouf. Matter of fact, I was at the flea market of all places. So they got this other flea market. Um, it's a Fairfax flea market. And it's like a, a little bit of a higher end flea market, but it is a flea market nonetheless. But it's cute. You know, they, you, they, lots of vendors, um, lots of vintage clothing and, and cool things, um, food and music. It's a cute little spot. It, it's worth checking out. Um, and I had um, a booth set up for my own business there of um, merchandise I was selling. And Sheila Buff proceeds to walk up and say something and show me a card and like sign up for this. I was like, first of all, I, you know, you're never expecting that. So you just like look and you're just like, who is this? This person looks familiar, but then they're kind of scrungy and weird. And you're not expecting that because you're used to seeing them in their movies. <laughs> and I, and I looked and looked, you know, I'm like, is she above? And I was like, oh, no, thanks. And he just kind of just tipped over my stuff. Like, I was like, okay, it was just bizarre. Um, so yeah, you know, so there's there's instances like that. And then, you know, some of the cool things were, you know, if you're into that sort of thing, you know, you're at the Grove hanging out, you see all the celebs doing their shopping. I remember one day Terry Ellis Ross was coming like out of Nordstrom's and I was coming in. I just kind of like looked like that because I, I got so sick of seeing celebrities and I'm, you're not paying my rent. OK, so I'm not going to be in your face like that. How about you be in my face? How about you, you know, get out of my way? <laughs> you know what I mean? What are they doing for us? That's why I don't understand why people get so starstruck. You know, they're just people. And I was um coming out and she was coming in. And she was very nice. She was like, oh, hey, girl. She was literally in her own little world. She's like, oh, hey, girl. Just very Tracy Ellis Ross, like how you see her in her stuff and how she is like on her Instagram. I mean, she was just like, hey, 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 like having a party by herself, enjoying her shopping. It was literally the most hilarious thing ever. Um, so, you know, stuff like that is nice. If you go hang out at the Grove, that's like the little spot, you know, people hang out on Melrose. Um, no one really hangs out on Rodeo Jack cause it's just a tourist spot. It's really pretty and nice. You know, just that main, that like one street Rodeo drive, like it's, it's very overrated y'all. Like I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer about this, but I want to just be very realistic. It's great to go for a vacation, but living is something totally different, um, which we're going to get into in a little bit. But again, if you're watching on YouTube, that's just kind of an explanation of some of the pictures. Um, you know, sometimes you get invited to these events. I got invited to a couple of events. You know, you get some clothes, you know, depending on what company. You just, you know, walk around, promote the clothes, promote the event, whatever it is, uh, you know, working at the Grove, I did, um, you know, working on set with different brands, different production companies, you know, the rooftop events are not, I do like LA because their rooftops are a little bit lower. I don't want to be on like the 20th floor on a rooftop. I'm good with like the third or fourth floor. Give me the second and I'm good. You know, so I did, you know, like their rooftops, you know, um, as opposed to New York where you like way up there. <laughs> um, so that was, that was very nice. Um, and everything. So 
But again, um, just take this all with a grain of salt. Um, if you have any questions about anything, the pictures or whatever, um, you know, just let me know. And yeah, so let's talk about some other things um, with Hollywood that you don't really um, always hear about too. So most of the actors that are in Hollywood are living paycheck to paycheck. As I mentioned, they do have other jobs and no one is, not everybody is going to make it into that 2% of successful people, or I, I would dare say even 1%. Okay. So you do have a lot of drug use. And because of that, you do have a lot of homelessness in the area. Um, you do have a lot of Dirtiness. Now, I'm gonna say this about LA as opposed to other cities, and, and some of the people who live in LA. I, I don't mean no disrespect, but LA is very unique in that it has so many homeless people living on the street to the point it's a health hazard. As I mentioned, um, you know, feces out on the street, human waste. I have literally seen dead bodies on multiple occasions at the beach, Venice. I'll never forget just, you know, pushing my little stroller along. First of all, no one who actually lives in LA goes to Venice Beach because they know it's gross. But when you're new in town, you're just, you know, you've seen all this stuff. So you want to go check it out. Gross. It's gross. Um, you know, and just pushing, walking along. All of a sudden I'm like, wow, that's awful weird. That guy looks blue. Oh, yuck. That dude's dead, man. This is really gross. So, you know, that's another thing. You know, when you have that many homeless people, sometimes they die right out there. And it might be some hours or a day before somebody realizes and come and picks them up. So it it's gross. It's gross. Now, if you're from LA, I know those people who are from LA, they're very good at going only to the places that they know are straight, that are legit. Like they don't know nobody from LA really goes to like Venice Beach. No one go like there's specific places that people go and don't go. Um, and a lot of people just stay in their own little bubble and they're good. And I don't like, like, I need to be able to enjoy all of my area and not just be like working home and over here and that's it. You know, I, mm -mm. so, um, the, it, it's the living conditions are not good. Okay. Because you have the homes, but then the rents are very expensive and what you get is not good. Most of the apartments do not have heat or AC and you're going to get an apartment because an 800 square foot home in LA is $2 million. And I'm not exaggerating. On my very street, there was an 800 square foot home. It was so cute that, oh, there's a little home for sale. I know it was going to be like at least a million, but I was like, I'm just going to like look at it anyway. You know, I just, let's just pull it up online. $2 million. 800 square foot home with a little itty bitty backyard. And there is a deranged homeless person going through the trash every morning. Why would I pay for that type of environment? Santa Monica is having some real serious issues now. Um, the homeless are basically taking over. Um, it's just a mess, guys. I, I honestly feel really bad about all that. And um, I do feel bad for the homeless people as well because some of them really have issues um, and it's sad. Um, no one should be homeless. Um, you know, it's some of it is, you know, self-inflicted, but at, at the same time, these are human beings. So it's just depressing to see people walking around sick, crazy, naked. I see naked people just walking in the middle of the road. Um, you know, so it's just not a good environment for, you know, a young family um, for me, um, for me, that's just what I chose. Um, I will also comment on, um, although I met a lot of friends and made some friends in Los Angeles, some that are so dear and so incredibly sweet, the general public, I did not like the vibes. I did find people to be very self-serving, um, very me first attitudes. Like, um, there's not a lot of hype in Los Angeles either. Like it's quiet. It's not loud. Like you go to like New York or DC. Oh, I love the energy there. Or Atlanta, you know, Miami. Like people are hype. Like, you know, if you're out at night at a restaurant, you hear the ha ha he he's and da, da, da. like a lot of the places in LA are dead. Like you'll be the only, it'll be like maybe one or two tables full and the rest of the restaurant is straight empty. Um, there are little scenes, you know, that get a little bit more crowded. 
But even on Sunset, it's like a lot of that is just dead. It's not popping, if you know what I mean. It's just like, wow, you would think that it would just be like crazy and people everywhere like, oh, it's Hollywood, it's Beverly Hills. No, it's not that type of thing. You will have more fun at a restaurant in your own local town, you know, um, you know, or, or for people who go to bars or whatever like that, you know, that people kind of joke and laugh and this and that. No, honey, ain't nobody going to talk to you out there. You'll be sitting there. Uh, uh-uh. Everybody stays in their own lane. And I think it's because there is such more like danger um, in the area. It is more um, criminal activity. So people don't engage much. Everyone kind of sticks to their self. There's not a lot of conversation you know, like in a grocery store, even, you know, sometimes, oh, someone walks past you, they may say, oh, you know, cute kid, or, oh, look at this sale, or man, this produce looks yucky today, like whatever. No one is going to really engage. <laughs> like people are much more just, hey, I'm in my own world type thing. Um, So that is just, you know, an observation. But again, there are lots of very sweet people um, in the Hollywood industry and just um, the general public. There are very nice people um, and there are people who aren't very nice. And there is also a lot of criminal activity. So that's just kind of, you know, all of that. Um, So, again, you know, um, it's just it's, it's just very interesting. OK, so let's let's move it along here. Um, a lot of, like I touched on the apartments, um, you know, you, you don't have a lot of amenities. Some of the conditions are quite poor. Like this is, you know, areas that you're not going to see, um, all the time when you're looking at the movies and this and that. And now I can even tell how they shoot stuff. Um, if they're shooting a film and parts of it take place in LA, I'm like, I know where they're at. And I know that there's a massive homeless encampment under that, you know, area. And so they shot that angle crooked because they were blocking all that out like you you know it's just it's just a shame so anyway <clears throat> now let's start to get into a little bit um on this writer strike okay so this writer strike is long overdue um and i'm it's it's a shame that people have to go on strike and stuff but i do want to say this um this is in no way shape or form a political platform um, so I don't in any way, you know, engage in politics or any politicized um, topics. I'm sharing this graphic here on YouTube because it is, you know, I'm going to talk about AI. We're going to go into some other topics. But again, just know that, you know, this I am in no way um, involved with politics um, or anything like that. OK, so um, with the strike, you know, what are they striking about? What is this all about? Um, and there was an article that I found that I really thought did a really good job, um, breaking this all down. This was actually from the, from nsjonline.com. Um, and it says AI is a wild card in Hollywood strikes. Here is an explanation of its unsettling role. And so first the writers, people are striking in Hollywood because they are sick and tired of not getting paid what they should be paid. So writers, until you become like a Shonda Rhimes, and again, only 2% of folks are going to become a Shonda Rhimes, you are not being paid a lot. The people who are going to make the most are the movie producers and the production houses. Okay. So if it's a Sony film, you know, Sony is going to make sure Sony makes all that. They're going to hire somebody to write a story. They're going to pay them X amount and that's going to be it. They might not get any residual incomes. I've seen um, people, you know, posting their, their residual checks and it's like 50 cent checks and stuff like that. And I got some of those just from the little teeny tiny bits of work that I did you know, and I'm in no way, you know, I wouldn't even call myself a real like actress like that. Or I mean, I never even got into the union. I didn't want to because I didn't even want to pay the dues and go that route. Because once you become into the union, you, you become recognizable. All of your stuff now is public. Your name is out there, all that. And so I never wanted to do that. So that's another thing. So with all of that, it's very difficult for these writers and actresses and actors are coming out now too because who makes the most money in Hollywood are those people, okay? That's why you have people like, you know, 
the Spielbergs and the this and that, you know, that, you know, some of them, they write their own stuff, but a lot of them, they buy stories, pay a really low amount for the story or hire a writer, pay a really low amount. And then they make all of this residual money off of it. I think like something that will work is, for example, let's take the movie Hairspray, which I'm going to have a graphic that has the main character from that. So that movie, they maybe they didn't know. And that's, that was not a big, you know, didn't have massive producers on it and stuff. Um, but it ended up to be a great little film. And maybe they didn't think it was going to do that good. But here's the thing. I think once a film hits the point of being like, okay, we made... I don't know, $60 million. Okay, well, now we have to go back. There should be some sort of, you know, clause where, okay, if the movie makes X amount, you have to go back and pay everybody X amount. Because I don't think it's fair that you make a movie, you know, let's say you have a million dollar budget and you um, spend, you know, 10000 on paying the lead actress right? Because you got to pay for camera. And the the uh, pro production sometimes is more than paying the actor's salaries. And then the the film goes on to make $60 million, but you only paid that actress 10000 for the role. That's not fair. I mean, that's it. Does it check out legally? Yes. But is it morally and ethically right? No. You know, if you make a killing on a movie and that's that person's face in the movie and you're making the money because that person is in the movie, you know, because the audience is drawn to that and they want to watch that movie over and over again and tell their friends about it. And you you don't come back to that person and, and give them more money. I think that that is wrong. And so this is what people are upset about. Writers are upset because they don't get very consistent. Their working is even less consistent than the actors and actresses because they'll get hired just to, you know, write something and then that's it. Or they may be under a very strict contract to where, okay, you we need you to write for this season, but we want you to write this season in six weeks and then... We're also going to put in the contract that you're not allowed to take any more work for another year, though, because they also have to compete with other networks, you know? So it's like, okay, how is that fair to the writer? How do they get to elevate themselves? What about those other months that they're under contract with you that they can't take money, but you're not paying them anything, you know? So again, there's a lot of things that I could say. Um, I think I said all of that that I said in the beginning about the negativities of the industry to say this. Why are so many people still in the industry? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, pack it up and leave. Like, it's not something that, you know, I, that was a part of my life for a certain time. And I moved on. Move on. You can't keep you know, and you see now some of the people, they're coming on camera, some of the actresses, some of the writers, and they're crying. Oh, I can't pay my rent. And one lady said, oh, I had to take my kid out of public school. Welcome to the real world. How about then if acting ain't paying the bills or writing ain't paying the bills and you got all this inconsistent with your job, leave. That will teach them. Go get another job. Go into another industry. You know who need jobs where jobs are very plentiful? The plumbing industry. We need plumbers. You know what else? Healthcare. We need healthcare people. Guys, you're chasing something that is not really worth it. Um, It's just not. And so that's my only gripe with some of this is that it's like, okay, if it ain't working for you, you need to do something else. But on top of it, You know, better things need to be in place so that things are fair because I do not think it's fair for a studio to be able to make all that money, pay some initial low money up front, and then, you know, they're just making it a killing on the back end, you know. Um, Yeah, and then the industry also chews people up and spit them out. How many cracked out child stars do we see? You know, my husband one day was, you know, just getting something from – 7-Eleven and he's like the dude from you got served came up to me and was harassing me for money he was like homeless and on drugs he's just like really you know hanging around LA hoping you get in another movie because you want to be famous and everybody to see you it's just like I mean I just 
it's just too much. And I know I'm probably sounding a little hard um, and a little judgmental, but we just have to to wake up on some of this stuff. Like, it's not worth it. It, it just is not worth it. So um, now some celebrities have come out to talk about this. Um, but before I move on to that, I do want to talk a little bit more about this article from NSJ Online. So artificial intelligence has surged to the forefront of Hollywood's labor fights, standing alongside more traditional disputes over pay models, which was the main part of it. You know, we talked about that, the inequality in pay. And then, of course, women having lesser wages. And then on top of that, also having to deal with sexual harassment and all kinds of other things, you know, in the industry. Benefits and job protections. AI technology is a wild card in the contract breakdowns that have led actors and writer unions to go on strike. The technology has pushed negotiations into unknown territory and the language used can sound utopian or dis dis Tiparian, depending on the side of the table. Here's a look at what the unions and their employers uh, each say that they want. Why artificial intelligence is a hot button issue as a technology uh, is to create without creators emerging star actors feel that they will lose control of their lucrative likeness likeness meaning their actual like you know video of themselves unknown actors may feel they'll be replaced altogether meaning like people like me who did background work just as like a side job you know because i was in a new area and hey make a little side money right people like that could easily be replaced with just, you know, going in um, and using AI to recreate some people in a the background. They look like they're real, but they're not actually, but you don't notice because it's a, a pushed away shot. Um, that's probably could happen. Um, but then again, if they don't have no background work, go get another job. You feel me? <laughs> like why keep fighting? And, and let me just talk about background work, y'all. I literally had done, I did so few background jobs because it is excruciating. You literally have to be available basically the 24 hour day. You cannot leave the set until they say cut. And if they got to do a scene eight times, you're stuck. Okay. There were some times that I did not finish rapping until three o'clock in the morning. And then they want you back there six. I was like, oh, they must be completely out of their minds. I was not trying to do that. It's too much. And so you're pushing your body physically. And how much was your check? The one thing, you know, a couple hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. Some of these people are making like two hundred dollars and that might be their only acting job that week. Why would you do it? How is that worth your time? So you see these people um, like, um, what's her name? I forget her name, but she was in the movie The Help. She was one of the lead actresses. You know, she was a background actor for years. Then she kind of moved her way up and she kept moving up and moving up. And now I want to say she's like in her late 50s. And, you know, she's in top list, a, a list uh, celebrity, you know, making millions and millions. I'm sorry, but all those lost years of wages of making literally nothing and having six jobs to make ends meet and living in a crummy apartment does not equate to being a millionaire at 58. That's a whole lot of years. That's over 30 years of wasted time in my book. I would have much rather left Hollywood and had a normal life in a nicer living conditions and like a, a regular job that I could go on vacation every year. I could go see some of my family every year. I can have a higher quality of life. Now she's having that. And that's where you see these people. Then they're like, you know, pushing 50 and then they're trying to like adopt kids. Now they're trying to go back in time because now they have the money to do it versus if they had to just left and, you know, took a normal course of life, been modest right and stuck to their you know some of some of them not everybody compromises their morals but a lot of them do if they had a kept their their you know morale and every, everything and who they are as a person in the forefront they would have had more years of successful life i'm not trying to be poor and broke and struggling all the way up to 58 i get one breakout role and then now i'm a millionaire that's that's not cute <laughs> That's not success in my book. 
Um, and it's, it's not worth it, but they will try to make you think that it is, and it is not. Okay. In my opinion, you know, this is just me giving my opinion. What, what does my opinion matter? You know? So anyway, unknown actors fear that they will be replaced all together and writers fear that they'll have to share credit or lose credit to machines. The proposed contracts that have led to both strikes last only three years. Even at the seeming breakneck pace at which AI is moving, it's very unlikely there would be any widespread displacement of writers or actors in that time. But, <clears throat> excuse me, unions and employers know that ground giving on an issue is one contract can be hard to reclaim in the next, okay? So again, let's talk about the AI for a little bit, and I'm going to get even more into it. AI has been around a long time, and I want to dispel some fears. I, I've heard a couple people being like, oh my goodness, AI, the computers are taking over. AI has been around since like the first, like, I don't know, I guess maybe Terminator movie that was like some before my time, but like that's AI. Like anything that is used to like we use AI, um, you know, in tech or um, in business to automate. It's automation. So if you can automate things, that's AI. And then AI um, deep fake, which is used in Hollywood, is basically taking people's faces and putting it on another body. Now. No matter what you're seeing online, what you're seeing online, most of you, you're looking at it on your phone. There is not a lot of like full-fledged AI movies yet because the technology is not there yet. Like you will see coming up here. Um, I think I have one on the screen of, um, what's the man name? The one who was also in Scientology. Um, Tom Cruise. He has a lot of deep fakes and um, they look fake, y'all. You could tell it ain't the real person. And so it's gotten a lot better. You think about some of the older movies that use AI, like example, um, Benjamin Button was one. Um, and then you look at some of the stuff now, it, it does look better. But what's changed is is basically just like with some of the things in tech, like before a lot of these automated automation tools were only available to the top tier people, um, you know, in tech now, like the AI technologies, those technologies have been available for decades. It's just now become more mass produced and more easy for everybody to use. You know, we even have certain apps now you can download and you can do like the AI version of yourself and all that. That's like a low end um, one. But, you know, there's there's more advanced ones that are now becoming more widespread. And because it's becoming more widespread, that is causing some issues because with the actors, Basically, what is happening is an actor's face, so they could be paid one rate and then buy a production company. Hey, we want to pay you to say these lines and do this. Okay. But then that production company with AI could hire another actor, rip their face and put it on somebody else, and then use their voice and face to make another movie or make even just another scene of a movie. I don't think we're going to see full AI movies you know, for a while, but it, you know, now we do see just like, again, Benjamin Button or Captain America, where there's clips of the movie that are AI, you know, they have to age someone up or down or whatever. It's AI, right? So um, that is what people are having an issue with. And I can understand where they're coming from because it's like, okay, you pay me one thing and then you take my face and put it on somebody else. What if that, I don't want my face being attached to something that you're promoting. Maybe you're promoting something that is against my beliefs or maybe something that's gross or weird. And I don't want my face on that. But these actors are saying as it stands right now, they basically are giving up their intellectual property, which is their likeness. Your likeness is intellectual property um, to these production companies. Um, if some things aren't put in place, some laws and things like that, that need to change or be passed so that, um, this doesn't become an issue. Um, I've already seen, you know, there's a lot of deep fakes and things going out there, but we're going to get more into that. But um, 
there are a lot of people right now that are coming that are coming out to speak against these things. Um, Jennifer Aniston, all these people are in solidarity, you know, with like, hey, we sh- we need to chill with this AI stuff, and we need to pay our actors and writers correctly. Snoop Dogg, um, Drew Barrymore, now Taraji P Henson. Taraji P Henson, I like most of the things that she's had to say, but I will say this: she's kind of a double edged sword because. I like the fact that she shared, and this was a couple years ago in an interview I saw, she said that, hey, you know, for, I think it was, yeah, for Benjamin Button, she said she was paid, I think, $100,000, but she had to pay 30% of that money to her agency, and then, you know, taxes and this and that. By the time she went, I'm like, girl, did you even walk away from that movie with 10 k Like, really? Really? And so... I appreciated her and applauded her for sharing that because now a lot of people will ride off of the cloud. Oh, I was in the movie and let people think that they're a millionaire when they're not. Taraji is very transparent and she does say like, hey, I don't have money like that. I struggle. You know, I'm not making as much as other people. And now what I noticed about Taraji is Taraji is pivoting. Taraji is do, getting into hair care. You know, I think she started some sort of nonprofit. I could be wrong about that, but she's doing other things. And I think she's slowly making her exit from Hollywood. I don't think we're going to really see Taraji in Hollywood like that because Taraji is smart enough to know this ain't paying my bills and it's not worth it. It's not worth all the issues, having people in the public knowing all your business. It's not worth it. You know, um, so it's good to see some of these higher up people are coming out and sticking up for the writers because the writing is important. But the writing in Hollywood, this is why we're seeing all of this um, very stagnant um, productions. We're seeing all the same stories being told on Netflix. We got a million and one Disney remakes. You know what I'm saying? It's like no one has any creativity more. But this is why, because they're not hiring real writers. I mean, the AI is not writing it, but what I'm saying is they got the same people with no ideas because they can't pay people, you know, and the people that that want the jobs, they're not willing to accommodate them and pay them properly. So you have a lot of these recycled stories and, you know, just, it, it all just seems very out of touch. So we got a lot of low quality production happening right now in Hollywood. Um, the stories aren't good. A lot of it just isn't good. People are just tuned out. It's like, how many remakes do we need? You know, how many times are we going to tell the same story? It's just bizarre. And the other thing that they push to is all of this very weird stuff. People are tired of that. We want normal stories about life, love, you know, family. Sure, there are some hard stories that need to be told. But I always think of people like Quentin Tarantino and all that weird stuff it's weird. But again, for those of you in our circle, um, our inner circle, my close friends group, we really know who is controlling Hollywood. And so when you see all of this stuff, it all makes sense. It's just not, it's pushing ideas and, and normalizing things that aren't normal and that are, are weird and bizarre. And so the happy, nice stories, what humanity needs right now get pushed to the bottom and all of the yucky stuff comes up to the top because it's shocking um and and hollywood will sell anything that is shocking because shocking sells. oh what was that what they say what oh my goodness so i tell people if you're tired of seeing this stuff stop watching it stop watching the crap if it's something that's crap don't see it don't support it even if it comes across your phone delete it you know, or say hide from my news feed, because then they will be forced to come back around to do more wholesome, nice things that people actually want to see. Okay, because this is all toxic. It's, it's just also toxic. Um, One of the companies I found so interesting, well, I'll share, I'll share that. I'll share that Um, as we get um through this a little bit more but yeah you know it, it's just a problem so I really hope that they can get it together but I do applaud to Raji for that but I at the same time other celebs when they come out and cry that they broke you know what I'm gonna say girl get a real job like a regular if it's not paying your bills stop riding off the clout you know what I mean um now let's talk about this a little bit Monique is another one who came out and I do have these up 
um, as well on YouTube if you're listening on podcast. And she, you know, she she was gutter for a while with some big wigs like Oprah and Tyler Perry, Lee Daniels, all those high up, you know, producers. And, and you know, I mean, the creme that Oprah is like, who, where else can you go but that, you know, in Hollywood and everything? And she's just like, they didn't pay me. She stood up for herself. Now she's making a comeback. I'm not really a fan of her a lot because she used a lot of profanity and is very vulgar. But, um, you know, on the things that were public, some of the articles that were ri- written up about um, some of the issues that, you know, were going on, I did read and I did see what her point was like, hey, I'm not being you know, paid fairly, you know, why does one person get a Netflix special for, you know, I don't know what it was, $60 million. And my same Netflix special is only one or no, I don't think her Netflix special was even, it was like 500,000, but then someone else is getting paid, you know, millions. Why? Why? You know, it just doesn't make any sense, but it's not just happening in Hollywood guys. This is every corporation. You know, we're all of us who work a regular job. We're dealing with the same thing. It's just on a smaller level. People pay people what they want to pay people. And it, it's just not right. Like, it's just not. Okay. Um, so then we have people, um, though, now Monique was able to speak out like that because she's a recognizable face. What about these people like, um, you know, the girl from Hairspray? You know, if you ever saw that movie, that that's one of my favorite movies. Or, you know, the the guy from, um, I think it was, the name of the movie was Captain, uh, it was something, something about Somalian pirates and it had Tom Hanks in it. Anyway, actors like that, actors like that, they, they're, they're getting a major role and they're next to someone, you know, that is an A-list celeb, but yet they're not getting the same pay. Now, I'm not saying that they should because that A-list celeb has probably been doing it for 30 or 40 years and they're brand new. So it doesn't need to be the same. But a lot of time they don't get any residuals. They just get paid that flat fee and they don't actually get any royalties from the movie. When you become an A-list celebrity, you get royalties. And I think that's what these you know other actors are saying. Okay, I'm a, you know, I'm not an A-list actor, but you know, I did have a leading role and I should be able to get some of these, you know, royalties, you know, just like everybody else. And obviously it would be a lower percentage of royalty, but still a royalty nonetheless, you know. So it it's just a shame. Um, you know, there's there's just so many issues um in Hollywood. Let's keep going. All right. So now let's talk a little bit more about AI. I was surprised to see, to hear Tom A. Hanks. Now, I only read one little blurb about it, but he seems to kind of be in favor of AI. He was saying something. Let me pull this up here again. Tom Cruise lobbied um, AMPTP over AI. ASAC after to consider permitting continued publicity efforts in Mr. Strike. Okay. Who's that? Oh, that's Tom Cruise. I'm talking about the wrong person. Sorry, y'all. We're going to talk about Tom Cruise in a minute. Tom Cruise is not for it, um, really. Although he has a lot of deep fakes. And Tom Cruise, in my opinion, is a little shifty. And, um, you know, he's he's into the Scientology and things like that. So half the time, I don't think he knows what he's doing. But that's a whole other subject. But um, now Tom Hanks. Where, where am I going to go on Tom Hanks? Let's see. Yes, here we go. Hollywood star Tom Hanks is talking about AI technology that could potentially make it possible for him to continue appearing in new films even after his death. Here's what he says, quote, what is a bona fide possibility right now if I want to is I could get together and pitch a series of seven movies that could star me in them in which I would be 30 year, 32 years old from now till kingdom come. Hank said while being interviewed on the Adam Burdock's podcast. So I'm going to just stop and think about that real quick. See, the way pe- the reason people like this is because they're thinking this is a way to immortalize themselves. You're still dead, man. Okay? You're not extending your life at all. And it's weird. Now, some of the things um, that I've been seeing with deep fake, and they, that article was on lastly.com. Um, we'll talk, let me let me talk about this a little bit more. Hanks added, anybody can now recreate themselves at any age they are. 
by way of AI or deep fake technology. AI could be a hit. I could be hit by a bus tomorrow and that's it, but my performances can go on and on. Outside of understanding that it's been done by AI or deepfake, there'll be nothing to tell you that it's not me and me alone, and it's going to have some degree of lifelike quality. Hank has reteamed with Forrest Gump director Robert Zemeckis for the movie Here will most likely use AI technology for the project to de-age him. The actor pondered whether audiences would care if AI is used in films. With the technology moving forward, Hank says that Hollywood agents are already drawing up contracts to protect actors. I can tell you that there are discussions going on in all of the guilds of the agencies and the legal firms in order to come up with a legal with legal ramifications of my face and my voice and everybody else's being our intellectual property, he said. So, I mean, Tom Hanks is usually a pretty stand-up guy. I don't follow celebrities like that, but, you know, you hear things from time to time, and I never heard him say nothing too crazy or weird. So this one was a little bizarre for me that he seems to kind of be on board with this. Um, he just thinking, oh, well, I can, they're thinking about their kids. I can continue my legacy of making money off my face even when I'm dead, but it's weird. And what I was saying before was I'm seeing a lot of these deep fake technologies where they are taking, like they did one of Michael Jackson. Um, you know, obviously he's deceased. I think they did. I can't remember if they did one of Whitney or not, but they're doing like some of these deceased people and doing these recreations with their voice you know, because the AI technology can recreate the voice and recreate their face. And I'm just like, okay, some things just have to come to an end. You know, then, you know, it's like, okay, you guys are already A-list celebrities, actors, and singers. When you die and pass on, then it's an opportunity for someone else. You still have, you know, your body of work that you've done and will always be able to you know, look back on your films and people are still going to draw from your film and say, hey, let, let's do something similar to this. Or you see how, you know, whatever, use it as an example. But to just try to keep pushing yourself on and not giving people the opportunity to me is very selfish. Um, these people are going to make plenty of money off of their movies as it stands currently without AI after they die too. So why keep pushing it further? And then now you're going to eliminate even more people from coming into the industry and making it even more unfair because people are, you know, still wanting to see Top Gun movies. So uh, Tom Hanks has been dead for 50 years. OK, well, let's just keep using the Tom Hanks deep fake. I mean, it's just bizarre. It's dumb and it's bizarre. I mean, come on, you know. So um, and again, right now, the deep fakes don't even look real. You see the one I got up with Tom Cruise. It's a close comparison, but it ain't, you could tell that it's not really him, okay? And the person that is having the deep face, virtual face put on them looks already a little bit like Tom Cruise. So you have to find someone who kind of fits their bill and then they, you know, put the AI face of the original person on. And it's just weird. It's just not that serious. Get a new person. Let us meet other actors, you know, babies are being born every day. Okay. Um, what's the point? And so again, it just shows you how Hollywood has a hold on these people. And I found it very interesting that one of the actual names of one of these highest, um, AI technology companies for Hollywood that specializes in the deep face for facial, um, recreation is called deep voodoo. So again, those of you in my close friends group know that in itself, the fact that this company is calling itself Deep Voodoo and they're doing all this AI stuff and recreating people, you know, and trying to like basically have them live on on screen. You I'm not feeling it. It's a no for me and a hard pass because to me, you're getting into a, a different territory. You're getting into something weird. Um, and that's inappropriate and I don't like it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just, just, 
it, it's just not it's just not good so you know we already have like the ai drake um and the ai weekend it, this is even more a bigger topic in music because it's very easy to recreate um the ai for music um and it it sounds like them i mean it basically is their voice it's just making their voice say things that they didn't say you know the recording of their voice so again we all you know people like the way drake sounds so if the Drake AI is making a ton of songs, you know, for the next 200 years, you know, how does the next person get an opportunity? Now we're becoming a very limited, if that were to actually happen, which, you know, I, I don't foresee that happening for many reasons, but if it were, it, the world would become very one dimensional. We'd have the same people doing stuff. We'd have, you know, it's just no variety. You know, you have to open things up. You can't just keep using the same people over and over again like that. And again, um, there's only but so much you could do. Why keep trying to to to, to push this? You know, um, yeah, it, it's just bizarre. So people who want to have themselves immortalized in some way are going to go for this because you know they think, hey, I can keep making money and you know people can still see me, you know, and all that. But it's it's just not. It's just not right. So anyway, um, that is my take on all of this, guys. You know, I'm just not feeling any of it. <laughs> um, and I hope that you found this all to be helpful. Um, this is just some randomness for me, my little two cents, you know, for my little behind the scenes stuff that I did. I ain't nobody, girl. I'm just, you know whatever but this is my two cents and i i know what i know and i've seen enough to see when stuff is weird i've seen enough to see that you know there's a lot of people being like kind of having a, a grand idea of a lot of the things in hollywood and it just isn't um the average person you know is living a, a very nice quality of life just a regular everyday person you who's listening from you know for myself or you all of us are living good quality lives. So don't let Instagram and, you know, what you're seeing on, you know, Netflix make you think that you're not because this is all, it's not like that. Set life is no joke. Um, those people who chase down work again, I never did because I did not want that life. So it was like, hey, whenever somebody says something to me, I'll go do it. But for the people who put their whole blood, sweat, and tears and willing to literally do anything for fame, they really hurt themselves badly. Um, and there's a lot of people out there like that and, and having issues. So my heart really does go out. Um, I hope this has been helpful to you if you're someone who's aspiring to be behind the scenes and hair and makeup. Um, me sharing some things there or um, someone who aspired to be in front of the camera or even if you just wanted to be like an influencer even that I don't like either it's it's just too much it's just too much and now it's like you literally have to be on Instagram or on TikTok all day every day they don't show you the behind the scenes that these people have whole teams you know, creating content, coming up with the ideas and all that. And if you individually try to do all that yourself, you're going to burn yourself out. That's why you don't see me on Instagram much no more, y'all. I'm, I'm not, I can't, I cannot. Okay. So anyway, guys, if you have any questions on this, we talked about so much in this episode. Um, Just to recap, in the beginning, you know, we kind of talked a little bit about Hollywood in general. I shared my experience about Hollywood. Then we talked about the writer strike and why they're upset and how, you know, the writers and actors are actually treated. Then we talked a little bit about the deep fake AI technology and, you know, how it is not really anything that is needed. I just don't think it's needed. Um, I think that it's cool, like in, in cases like, hey, Benjamin Button, where they were able to like, you know, age a person backwards. It's something to use just for that specific purpose. But when now you're trying to use it to prolong people's acting careers beyond their demise, it's like, why? <laughs> Excuse me. 
Um, so that's that's the thing. Everything has to have boundaries and limitations and it just makes sense. And that the way it is going right now it doesn't make sense. So I hope that they will get a handle on this. Um, and everything will be good. But yeah, drop me a line. Um, while we are here, please do me a favor. If you have not already, um, like this video, um, like this podcast episode, share this podcast episode. Um, subscribe on podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Also subscribe on YouTube, um, especially if you like to listen on podcasts more. But if you want to see visuals sometimes, hop on over to my YouTube channel and subscribe there. You can also give me a follow on at workladypodcast.com. Oh, at, I'm sorry, that's my website. But <laughs> yes, follow me on Instagram as well. Um, because I always appreciate that. And I do occasionally, um, post some things on Instagram and sometimes I'll just come on and, um, talk on my stories and things like that. I am not going to be doing as much, um, on camera, um, work on, on YouTube. Um, so, you know, I really just kind of, you know, be kind of behind the scenes more so, um, on podcasts and on Instagram. So, um, but yeah, I mean, everything will be also shared to YouTube, but just letting you know, you know, I'm, I'm more so behind the scenes. Okay. And. Put your body in the...